How you all doing? Very well. Thanks for uh, taking some time with us during your lunchtime and your busy summer schedule. Hope everything is going well. So my name is Mark Gomez and I'm with the Haas Institute for a Fair and Inclusive Society at UC Berkeley. And we bring together academic students, um, policy makers, community activists, labor activists, to think and figure out what we should do about extreme inequality and in all its manifestations. I head up what we call the Leap Forward Project, which is trying to think about and honing in on wage, income, and asset policies. How do we dramatically improve people's lives? Got some ideas on that coming up. And so the Thinking Ahead series, this is the 11th one we've done. The first one, we're actually bringing someone from across the country, hopefully eventually around the world, because uh, good ideas happen everywhere. And so Thinking Ahead really is for all of you to be able to take a step back from the day-to-day -day work that you do and get to hear about provocative ideas of how we can dramatically improve people's lives not just do the usual critique on extreme inequality, but figure out what the path forward is. And I know this is hard to say during the years of uh, President Trump, but we really are in this, especially here in the West Coast from Oregon, Washington State, and California, at a place where we can really begin to move progressive policies and the responsibility is for us to set the example and create the programs and the politics that will work across the rest of the country. So very excited to have Professor Sandy Darity, we'll figure out the uh, tech glitch in a second here. And, but first I want to introduce, so as part of the Haas program, we're lucky to have um, a whole bunch of summer fellows with us. And so first I'm going to have EJ tell you a little bit about himself, and then I'll introduce Professor David. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is EJ Toppin. Um, like Mark said, I'm a summer fellow at the Haas Institute for a Fair and Inclusive Society. I'm also uh, a rising second year student at the Goldman School of Public Policy at UC Berkeley. Um, my area of interest is um, racial justice policy looking at systems of oppression that create and perpetuate uh, disadvantage and looking at how to uproot and dismantle those through policy making. Um, which is why uh, I'm very fortunate to be at a place like the Haas Institute um, this summer at Haas I'm working on displacement in Richmond, California and um, water uh, crisis in Detroit, Michigan. Both issues are highly racialized, so I'm um, very fortunate to be at a place to do that type of work and, and that type of thinking. Um, and I'm particularly happy to be here with Professor Darity to talk about his work um, with the Federal Jobs Guarantee in addressing um, racial disparity in employment. Thank you. Okay, so I'm betting, given the, the size of the crowd, that you all know probably more about Professor Darity than I do, but I'll give you the, the basics is that he is a professor of public policy and economics at Duke University um, in the other Silicon Valley, in the triangle as they call it. And so I'm gonna give it over to Sandy to talk about the ideas that he wants to lay out for us today. We're going to focus on income inequality and poverty today. Uh, and I'm going to do that by uh, trying to provide you with some insights about a policy proposal that we refer to as the creation of a national investment employment corps, which would in effect provide a public sector option for employment for all Americans. The premise here is that uh, every American citizen should have the capacity to find work at decent pay and that that type of social insurance and assurance would be provided by uh, the commitment on the part of the federal government to ensure that it would function as an employer of last resort. So that any citizen who could not find adequate work in the private sector 
would be able to uh, to find a quality job with the public sector. Uh, our premise is that the lowest level of compensation for one of the jobs under a federal job guarantee should be approximately $23,000 so that we would ensure that everybody would have a, a, a level of income above the poverty line. Now that $23,000 would be the base compensation, but there would also be benefits including the type of medical insurance that is currently received by uh, federal civil servants. And, for that matter, by federal elected officials. So, um, in effect, we, we think that this would be a way of providing a high degree of empowerment for, uh, for America's workers uh, in a number of ways. Uh, the first is that the job guarantee and its compensation would set the floor on the type of compensation that would have to be offered by the private sector. So, in effect, there could not be any significant number of private sector jobs that would not offer at least the same terms of employment as that offered under the National Investment Employment Court. So, uh, so that's the first thing. I mean, in, in effect, we would really be mandating, uh, mandating an effective universal minimum wage. Uh, the difference between this and existing minimum wage and living wage laws is that a federal job guarantee would ensure that everyone would have the opportunity for holding a job and also for holding a job with a sufficient number of hours of work so that they could have non-poverty incomes. In contrast, minimum wage laws, while they ensure a certain level of wages for folks who have jobs, they do not guarantee that everyone will have access to a job and they do not guarantee a certain number of hours of work. So, uh, so, so we think that this is, in some sense, a more effective way of setting a floor on the quality of compensation that would be provided for all Americans. Um, in addition, this is also a way of implementing the Humphrey Hawkins Act, or what was formally called the Full Employment and Balanced Growth Act of 1978. That's a piece of legislation that was passed almost 40 years ago that uh, directs the U.S. government to preserve full employment and to maintain price stability simultaneously. Now, uh, what's, what's interesting about the Humphrey Hawkins Act is that it has been in existence for close to four decades, but it remains an unfunded mandate. And so uh, what, what the federal job guarantee could do is, in effect, put meat on the bones of the Humphrey Hawkins Act. It could, it could guarantee or it could ensure that we would always have conditions of full employment in the United States. With the existence of a federal job guarantee, anybody who wants to work would be able to find work. Uh, and and that's, that's a sharp contrast with the, the historic conditions and the current conditions that we experience in the United States, where there is customarily a shortfall of quality jobs relative to the number of people who are seeking seeking employment. Uh, so th this is why we refer to the federal job guarantee as a direct route to full employment. And uh, I think that's, that's a critical dimension and it's a way of actually uh, making the Humphrey Hawkins Act have, have substance and meaning. I'd also like to indicate that the, there are precedents for this type of program in the American experience in particular in the 1930s with the introduction of the Civilian Conservation Corps and the Works Progress Administration. And these are, are critical, uh, critical programs that were introduced in the midst of the Great Depression for the purposes of trying to find employment for many Americans uh, at a stage where the national unemployment rate had reached, uh, this is almost a fantastic figure, 25% which meant that one out of four Americans who were looking for work at that point could not find a job. And that excludes the folks who had surrendered the search for work as a consequence of, uh, of the high degree of, of depression in the American, the American economy. Uh, the federal job guarantee would make it uh, would make that type of a program or opportunity like the WPA or the CCC a permanent option for all Americans, 
uh, and it would be universal. So it would apply to all individuals who are at least 18 years of age or, or older. Um, and so um, uh, we would have a way of extending the principles and ideas that underlay the, uh, the Works Progress Administration and the Civilian Conservation Corps into the 21st century in a very, uh, in a very meaningful and powerful way. Uh, I'd less, like to also emphasize that there are some strong social benefits that could be associated with this type of a program that goes beyond the assurance of full employment and goes beyond the assurance of quality jobs because we also can pay very close attention to the types of jobs that might be performed under this type of program. And these types of jobs could have a great deal of social utility. Uh, in, in work that we've done on this subject in the past, we've emphasized the possibility of having uh, well-trained members of the National Investment Employment Corps provide child care services, provide elder care services. So the, the human care, the human infrastructure dimension of this program would be something that would be very, very important. Uh, we also could train workers to assist individual homeowners with the process of transforming their homes from energy inefficient sites to sites that might rely on solar energy instead. Uh, so there could be, a, uh, we, could, we could provide people with a low cost, of, low cost opportunity to make those kinds of transitions in the way in which they, they engage in energy, energy usage. Um, we also could work on the physical infrastructure of the society. This could include, obviously, the classic areas in which the Works Progress Administration made contributions. Uh, this would include uh, roads, bridges, and highways, most obviously. But there also could be work that was done on aspects of the physical infrastructure that provide direct human services. So, for example, uh, workers in the National Investment Employment Corps should, could, could invest a substantial amount of their time in, in actually repairing and improving uh, the physical facilities of our nation's school uh, in many urban areas, in particular. Uh, the physical structures of our, our nation's schools are, are in abysmal condition and uh, could be improved and allow young people to actually have healthful and visually pleasant environments in which they could uh, engage in learning. So, um, so that's that's the that's some of the primary uh, dimensions of this program that I'd like to emphasize at this stage. Uh, but I'd also like to add that a program of this type would ensure employment opportunities for workers who are most likely to be excluded from that option in the American economy. So, for example, this would provide an opportunity for individuals who have been incarcerated and who have completed their sentences uh, to be guaranteed the option of having, uh, having a job once they, uh, once they leave prison. Uh, given the, 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 uh, the stylized fact that the black rate of unemployment is always two times the white rate of unemployment, uh, in, in fact, that, that two to one ratio applies at all levels of education. And, uh, and, and, and whites with, uh, with, uh, with whites who have never finished high school actually have close to the same unemployment rate as blacks who have finished some college education, very similar unemployment rates. Uh, so so the, it, it's, 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 it's paramount and obvious that there's uh, high degrees of discrimination that operate in the American labor market. And a way in which we could address this is to have a federal job guarantee for all American citizens, which could make it possible to eliminate that unemployment rate differential. It would not necessarily eliminate the wage differential, the average wage differential between black and white workers, but it certainly would uh, eliminate the unemployment rate differential. Uh, and so that's, that's, that's quite significant. Uh, in addition, um, the premise of this project would be that virtually everyone can do some type of socially useful work. Uh, obviously, there are going to be a small number of people who probably are physically absolutely incapable of performing any, any, any type of work. 
but, but those are going to be very small numbers. And uh, this is the type of program that would presume that individuals who have certain disabilities uh, could actually find jobs to do that would be extremely helpful to the society as a whole that could be tailored to their capabilities. Um, and, uh, and I would also add that somewhere between 40 to 50 percent of individuals who are homeless actually have jobs. Uh, they don't have particularly well-paid jobs, but they have jobs. And uh, the kind of crisis that's associated with uh, their inability to, to, to have comfortable shelter uh, also could be addressed through a program like this. Um, the last thing I'd like to say, and before we open this up to a conversation, is that we conventionally have been thinking about this as a program that's to be introduced at the federal level. Uh, but we're also realistic enough to know that at the present moment, it's unlikely that any uh, socially transformative uh, program will actually be adopted by the federal government. So we've been increasingly thinking about ways in which a program of this type might actually be adopted at the municipal level. At least that would provide us with an opening wedge or a gateway towards the wider expanse of the expansion of this program. Uh, and it also would provide us with an opportunity to have demonstration projects so that we could determine how to make this program more effective when it's finally embraced at the federal level. Um, and so we've actually done some thinking about how expensive it would be in local municipalities uh, relative to a typical municip municipality's budget, the smaller the community, the more, the, the greater the relative expense of the project, it seems. Uh, so, for example, uh, in, in my home city of Durham, North Carolina, we estimate that if we put everyone to work who is unemployed in the city of Durham through a program of this type, uh, it would probably cost about $600 million. Uh, the city's annual budget is closer to $450 million. So that's a, uh, that's a sharp differential that works to the disadvantage of the, of the community in terms of the realism of adopting such a program. So in that situation, we might think about having a program that at least initially is more targeted. It's directed at those areas of the city with the highest unemployment rates uh, so that uh, it becomes more feasible to at least uh, at least begin it. So then maybe you could then phase in the program so that it would uh, apply to a, a, more and more sections of the city until it becomes something that's a citywide program. On the other hand, in a, a very large metropolitan area like New York City, uh, we estimate that if you were to put all the unemployed to work, it would cost about $10 billion, and that's actually one-eighth of the city's current budget. So. Uh, very different in terms of the order of magnitude of the task and the expense relative to the standard expenditures that the city is undergoing. Um, I think that that's what I'd like to say as a starting point for this conversation. Uh, I, I, I'm thinking that we not only need to think about a federal job guarantee, but we also need to think about local or municipal job guarantees as well. I'm just going to make a brief comment and then turn it over to EJ. Uh, for a question. I think it's interesting. I normally don't really like going back to the New Deal and justifying programs today and thinking about the economy because it was such a radically different economy then. But what I think is curious is to really hear the Works Progress Administration. It was about progress. And when we come to power, we have to figure out what is that progress that's going to excite people and that's going to inspire people, but it's also going to give momentum that we're the people that can make everyone's life dramatically better. So I think that's what's so enticing about this, is how we can finally deal in a real and significant way with uh, racial economic exclusion in this country and how it can define a new progressive politics, which is kind of an intro to EJ's question. Well, thank you, Professor Darity, um, for your talk. Uh, my question, um, is this, so uh, social welfare programs oftentimes um, become uh, tainted 
with people's or by people's prejudices. Um, you know, I think about uh, you know opportunistic politicians dog whistling and peddling you know the pejorative welfare queen, and then you know welfare um, has a negative image and connotation in the public's mind. Um, how do you prevent a program like this from um, falling victim to the same sort of thing, where you know this is presumably a program where people will use this? And you know, matriculate to uh, more gainful employment. How do you prevent um, participants in this program from being stigmatized um, by that sort of thing, or have the program lose popularity in the public's mind um, through association with um, what the public or society uh, deems or perceives as lesser or less deserving people? So. Um there's absolutely no way to prevent opponents of a program of this type from trying to paint it in the worst light possible. So the question is whether or not the, uh, the attributes of this program are powerful enough to overcome that type of an effect. Uh, also keep in mind that if individuals are stigmatized and, from participating in the program, and that prevents them from getting jobs outside of the program in the private sector, then they can just continue to work in this program. Uh, so, so stigmatization doesn't have the same kind of penalty that might be associated with other kinds of attributes a person might have. But, uh, but I'd also like to, like to say that this is a universal program so that there is no eligibility criteria, there is no means test for participating in the program which is definitely the case for most of our social insurance programs. So, uh, you know, no one can make the argument that somebody is undeservedly choosing this type of uh, a job option, since it's a job option that's available to anyone who wants it. Uh, and then the last point I'd like to make is, you know, the folks who are most likely to make these kinds of claims about welfare queens and uh, <laughs> folks fraudulently taking advantage of the, uh, of the, of, of the social welfare uh, net are folks who would presumably argue that those individuals who are relying on those programs are receiving, uh, receiving money for, for doing nothing. But the premise of the federal job guarantee is that you get paid for doing work. And so, uh, in, in fact, we'd actually find out who really didn't want to work if such a program was in existence. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, so folks, you know, folks on the right ought to be enthusiastic about this as an alternative to our existing social insurance programs, uh, you know, if they were consistent. Now, you know, they're not always logically consistent. Thank you. Okay, so questions from all of you, if you can, um, Stand up and say who you are, and then a question. Hi, my name's Lenise. I'm a co-founder with the Hood Incubator, and I was really excited um, listening to your uh, your talk. Now, thank you. Um, and I was interested in the focus on when you were mentioning about the difference between Durham and, and New York City and the city's budgets, and it was a geographic geographic you know, target of of the regional area of how it could help. But I was thinking, is there a way to think about tackling um, the same issue on un like unemployment or a chronic unemployment through an industry basis? And I'm biased, I, I work in the cannabis industry. So I'm thinking, you know, just the city of Durham, you said their budget was 450 million. Um, you know, looking forward to the legalization of cannabis, we know that we're estimating at like 7 billion by 2020. Um, is there a way to use an industry that isn't mature, that isn't even like really nascent yet, to try? How do we how do we intercept a nascent industry where there is no standards of fuckery yet, to <laughs> to ensure that um, we are getting those 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 uh those uh, those jobs to our communities? Do you do you have a way of how to like make a program or something? Yeah. I, I'm I'm not sure I. Got that correctly. Are you asking how we might go about ensuring that there is full employment in specific industrial sectors? 
Yes, because yes, because I was thinking the geography seemed to have some type of limitation. You just threw Durham up there, and you're like, it would take 600 million to execute the program, but the city's budget is 450 million. I'm thinking yeah. um, you look at the same population, and, you, and if you were able to grow the cannabis industry in North Carolina, you probably can get a good some in between between workforce working and tax revenues coming in. So I'm just thinking, is it like too small of a way to think about on this on an industry level, or does so, it have to be a uh, geography you know, level? So this is very specific to Durham. But if we actually merge the county and the city budgets, then it would be more feasible to do this. Unfortunately, the structure that we have in North Carolina separates the individual city's budgets from the county's budget. And the county actually takes the largest share of the local property taxes. So that's it's very, Kind of very specific to Durham and to North Carolina, but uh, but the story could be altered if we had a different structure in terms of uh, in terms of the budgeting operations at the local level. Uh, that said, um, I'm not sure this will really answer your question because I'm not sure I fully understand it. But this is not a proposal where we're generating employment by subsidizing jobs with the private sector. These jobs are purely and fully provided through public sector funding. <coughs> so there would not be any attempt to build employment in one sector versus another. Uh, in fact, I mean, getting to full employment means that you would have full employment in all sectors of the economy because there would be nobody who was looking for work who could not find it, regardless of which sector they might have previously been employed in. Uh, so I don't, I don't know if that answers your question, but uh, never have really thought about trying to produce sector-specific high employment. I've only thought about the importance of trying to generate high employment across the entire community or across the entire nation. Well, maybe the way of getting at it is, and I know a little bit about Durham, Raleigh, et cetera, but to me, it, it can't be at the city level because labor markets are at the regional level, yeah. and we have the problem of all the people that live in the small places. So how do you get at this both where you're dealing at the regional level of Silicon Valley and targeting industries where we want people the opportunity to grow and being kind of like a, myself being a working class immigrant kid i'm good at math i could sit at home and be good at math it's harder to be good at the cultural stuff than it is to be good at you know the stuff you can do on your own so to me that's a natural path forward so you would have to sit down with google and facebook <laughs> etc and try to open up those industries have you thought about that so the question of opening up industries that are in exclusive or, uh, or that, are, yeah, that are exclusive, I think requires a different set of policies and they must be close, more closely related to anti-discrimination policies. Uh, and and I certainly don't think that we would, there, there are some programs we get rid of in the process of adopting uh, the, uh, the federal job guarantee. But these would be more closely related to uh, so-called entitlement programs, like uh, unemployment insurance probably would not be needed at the same scale if we had a federal job guarantee. Uh, on the other hand, uh, uh, policies that attempt to desegregate industries or industrial sectors, those would still be vital and would be needed. Uh, and so I, I, I think that in a sense, this, that's not something that can be accomplished by the federal job guarantee, except for the fact that the federal job guarantee will generally create a much tighter labor market, which generally works to the advantage of groups that have been historically excluded. Okay. Other questions all the way in the back? It's kind of a two-part question. One is you mentioned the bottom is 23000 for the, the, the guarantee. What would the top be? The one-part question is what would the top be? And is it based on uh, union type wages based on each sector? That's the one first part of my question. Okay, good question. 
I don't know what the top would be. Uh, I've estimated that the average cost per worker would be somewhere between fifty to fifty-five thousand dollars. That's a cost that's estimated based upon uh, the baseline for the lowest paid workers being about $23,000, an additional $10,000 in benefits, and then uh, additional expenses that would be associated with training costs, as well as the materials and supplies, and the higher salaries for folks who would have uh, managerial and teaching assignments within the program. So uh, I'm not sure exactly what the top salary would be, but the best I can do for you now is say that the rough estimate of the cost per worker would be about $55,000. Uh, I'm not sure what the salary is that would have to be offered to get uh, the folks involved in this program who could provide the high quality training or the monitoring or the management of, uh, of the employees across the entire system. Okay, because I asked that question because you mentioned that 60, 40 to 60% of the homeless people are working class. If that's the case, and the bottom is that 23 Well, I mean, I, you know, you could argue they're all working class, but no, okay. what I said was 40 to 50% of the folks who are homeless actually do have jobs. Do have jobs, okay. Yep. So they yep. have jobs. That means that if they were guaranteed a, a salary of 23000 whether you take taxes or not, that means if they wanted to get a house, that their income would, would not provide enough for them to even get out of their homeless situation because if you take a third of that, you're at $400 a month, $500 a month. So is putting all of the money into this program going to, if it's not even going to reduce homelessness, what, 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 other, what other kind of, you know, where are we going to go with this income? Yeah. So, um, you know, I can't guarantee that it would eliminate homelessness, but I think that if you had households where there was more than one individual who was receiving this minimum uh, compensation, so if it was a couple household, uh, for example, and both members of the, uh, of the, of the couple household were working in this, in this program, then we're talking about an income of closer to forty-six thousand uh, dollars. Don't necessarily need to uh, alter somebody's uh, residential status by having them purchase a home. I mean, they certainly could be renters. Uh, and so the question then becomes whether or not we could find uh, that the, whether these incomes would be adequate for them to be able to to rent a decent home. But I warrant that the folks who are homeless are earning significantly less than $23,000 a year. So um, at, at, at minimum, this would actually give them more income than they're currently receiving, whether or not it enables them to, to purchase a home. Another question. Right here in the middle. Hi, my name is Eloise Patton. And I wanted to know a couple of things. Is this going to be linked to the cost of living index? I mean, is the language fluid so that it can increase? The other question is, many times people have benefits, social benefits, and then they're able to get employment, the benefits are cut, and they end up in the same circumstance that they began with. Is there language that would allow or prevent people to, from say their childcare getting cut? food stamps getting cut. Mm -hmm. and, and in many cases, housing subsidies then begin to reduce, um, and then as their salary increases, so then they still stay in that same area. Have, is there a language that will be included that's fluid that will um, accommodate this? And the, another question is, in terms of, we talked about regionality, um, cities, communities, neighborhoods, if that might, it seems like that would be the system to begin that in a municipality and then begin, you get three cities, then you begin to talk regionally and then you can move to state and then you can move forward. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Um, so uh, with respect to the first question you asked about cost of living increases, that's, that's the easy one, yes. Uh, that, that would be built into the program uh, and there's uh, several places where we've described the program where we've included some discussion. Second
second question is a little bit tougher, and you may not like my answer, but one of the premises of introducing this program is to significantly reduce expenditures on a wide range of so-called anti-poverty programs. So uh, there would not be these kinds of notch effects because many of these benefit programs would no longer exist. Uh, the premise here is that we are going to eliminate poverty through providing people with adequate incomes through employed work. Uh, and so uh, the only folks who would be, uh, would, would, would constitute a serious issue under these conditions would be folks who actually are not physically able to perform any type of work. Uh, so uh, so I, I would, you know, I'm inclined, I'm, I'm inclined to say, let's get rid of unemployment insurance altogether. My collaborator, Derek Hamilton, doesn't want to go that far. He says that there's some transitional period between when somebody might lose a job and, uh, and, and when they could get the employment with the public sector opportunity so that they might need some protection at that stage. Uh, my sense is if you lost the job, you could walk right over to the National Investment Employment Corps office the same day and get a job with the government uh, under, under, uh, under the circumstances where we have a fully operative program. Uh, so, uh, but you know, to, 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 put a, to put a fine point on it, many of the entitlement programs that you're talking about would no longer be necessary. My name is Carla Mays. Uh, my company is Mays Civic Innovation, and uh, David Capelli and I have launched the SMART cohort, which deals with uh, equitable development in smart cities. And my question has to do with um, automation. We're going to see enormous amounts of automation in the next, uh, in the next decade. And how does that affect um, these jobs? Because we're talking about a leaning of jobs at a time, you know, I, in you know, we're moving in the digital transformation. So how does that work with getting full employment if we're undergoing this leaning of jobs? So, um, there, you know, there's this raging debate over whether automation is going to eliminate uh, jobs. Uh, I, I think automation will eliminate certain kinds of jobs. I don't think it will eliminate work. Uh, we all will have to perform a variety of work, particularly the human care work. Uh, I suspect, well, I mean, I know that we can do this, but I'm not sure it's a great idea to robotize <laughs> elder care or child care. Uh, and and I, I think we probably should avoid doing that. Uh, so that, that's an arena where we will continuously have a need for work to be performed. Uh, but historically, automation has simultaneously destroyed certain categories of work and created new lines of work. And we have to see if that's what happens on this wave as well. Um, I, 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 you know, I have no reason to think that this wave will be different uh, so that uh, all, all of humankind will be freed of having to engage in any form of labor whatsoever. Uh, we might you know, end up uh, having to do uh, higher levels of thought labor than we have in the past, uh, all of us. And therefore, we'll need to have a community, an international community, where folks are well prepared to do that type of critical thinking and uh, engage in, uh, I guess, what Robert Wright calls symbolic logic work. So, uh, but but I just don't I just don't anticipate that automation is going to eliminate work altogether. It, it may well eliminate uh, a, some, some significant range of jobs, but it may also create another range of jobs that uh, we, we can't fully anticipate at the moment. Okay, thank you. Up to you. Yes, uh, Dr. Derry, this is an excellent program. I think uh, your research is timely. Uh, I had three part questions, if I could, please. Uh, I'm, I'm Henry Williams. Uh, with BJW Insurance, we're here in the lab. First, first question is, how can we move this type of program forward with the current uh, discourse and dysfunction in Congress? They can't seem to get their acts together on, on any major policy areas. 
uh, let alone something as innovative and as important and timely as this? It's the first question. Can you ask all three at the same time? Yeah, so, 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 second, second question is, did you do the first question, doctor? I did, I did, I did. Yeah, and, and the second question is, did we lose our oppor a window of opportunity with this type of great program when we started to invest all this money in the wars in Iraq? We spent over $5 trillion in the wars in Iraq, which it seems to me the economy, we had a lot more wealth, a lot more capital in the economy, less regulation, we had a better environment, and we had a tremendous amount of effort that was spent on loss of lives, and it was just a waste. We lost, we spent all this, now we have a massive deficit. So to come back now and say, okay, let's, let's do something that's viable and invest in the peace, it seems to be a stretch with Congress because they're going to claim that, well, we really don't have resources now, we have this massive deficit. Question number two. Question number three, I really appreciate the first comment you made about the wealth gap because I think that's at the heart of the entire issue, and I know that that's not a topic today, but I'm really interested in your perspectives about the Pew studies between the wealth gaps between whites and blacks and Hispanics in this country. It is such a dramatic issue. The Pew Research Group has done a phenomenal job, which documented over the course of the last 20 years, the wealth gaps more than 20 to 1 between whites and blacks, just as an example. 20 to 1 in a democratic society, which is amazing. I just want to hear your perspectives. So uh, I don't think anything constructive can be moved forward in Congress right now. Okay. So what, what, what needs to be done is to change Congress. Uh, that's, that's a tough fight given the way in which uh, gerrymandering has been engineered across the country, but, uh, but it's a fight that has to be fought. So uh, if, if we want any kind of uh, valuable legislation to be, to be passed at the national level, we need a different Congress. Uh, you're absolutely right about the cost to the society as a whole uh, associated with overinvestment in war efforts. Uh, but I think it not only creates a blockage for the introduction of something like the federal job guarantee, but it also creates a blockage for any type of social program uh, that we might think is actually going to be transformative in the United States. However, uh, I'm not somebody who fears the deficits. Uh, first thing I'd like to say is, uh, you know, it's, it's really interesting that uh, so many of the obstructionists in Washington complain about the expenses of new programs after several trillion dollars were handed over to the investment banking community overnight. So where did they find that money? Uh, I, I would argue that the fact that there, that capacity existed suggests that it's not really all that difficult to fund major new programs. Indeed, uh, there, there's a sense in which the federal deficit is not really a national debt, but that's another, that's another big hairy argument. It certainly is not analogous to the indebtedness of households. Okay, so that's, that's kind of the myth that gets perpetrated in thinking about that. Uh, but as I also said, uh, in response to one of the earlier questions, uh, many of the existing entitlement programs would, 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 be, uh, would be eliminated or greatly reduced if we had a federal job guarantee that ensured everybody of non-poverty wages. Uh, essentially, the $23,000 figure constitutes approximately an 11 to $12 average wage at the, per hour. Uh, that's not as high as the $15 living wage that uh, folks like, like Mark have been, have been fighting for, but it is significantly higher than the, uh, the national average for, uh, for minimum wages. So it, it would be transformative in that sense. Uh, if we were to introduce a program that had a cost of about fifty to fifty-five thousand dollars per worker. If we had put all fifteen million people to work who were uh, thrown out of work during the Great Recession, the program would cost about seven hundred fifty billion dollars. 
the total cost of our various anti-poverty entitlement programs is virtually the same. Uh, in in, uh, in 2012 or 2013 or so, it was about $747 billion. So uh, you, you could actually construct this program and offset the expenses by reducing other types of programs. Uh, finally, you mentioned the wealth gap and the Pew studies. Uh, so um, I think those studies have been very, uh, very useful and, uh, and valuable. Uh, but I also, you know, in, in my more egotistic moments, uh, would like to mention some of the studies that we've done at my own research center, the Samuel Du Bois Cook Center on Social Equity, uh, where we've examined some dimensions of the wealth gap that I think have proven to be quite surprising and provocative uh, for folks. We have a report that's called Umbrellas Don't Make It Rain. And uh, in that report, we demonstrate that, um, uh, that blacks who are working full time have lower levels of wealth than whites who are unemployed. That blacks whose income is in the third quintile of the income distribution have less wealth than whites whose incomes are in the first quintile. And that blacks with a college degree have two thirds of the net worth of whites who never finished high school. So these kinds of disparities are stark. They are perhaps the most dramatic indicator of the degree to which this society has racialized access to resources for opportunity. Uh, they're reflective of this notion that uh, Charles Tilley introduced many years ago and that, uh, uh, that Richard Reeves has used in his recent book, The Dream Hoarders, about uh, the phenomenon of what, what we call opportunity hoarding or preserving position or preserving status on the part of those folks who are already well positioned in the society. Uh, and so, uh, so yes, those wealth studies are very important, and I think that they're particularly important in telling us, uh, the, the, indicating the, the degree to which we cannot make the claim that there's been significant racial progress in America. It's fundamental that we escape the scarcity, austerity mindset of the last couple of generations, and you know more about them than I do. The new monitorists, including uh, Stephanie Kelton, from uh, University of Missouri, Kansas City. The economy doubles every 40 years. So literally, in doubling, we create something out of nothing. That's the fact of the economy, not what the conservatives say, there's more than enough to go around. So in the next 20 years, the US economy will create seven trillion in income, 27 trillion in wealth. The question is, how do you want to spend it? Frankly, when you talk to uh, progressives, they can't even get to the seven trillion, how we can spend it. And my assumption in all of this, the last 40 years, that money's been literally taken by a very small segment, less oh, than the 1% of 1%, and that's just mathematically true, undebatable. If we continue down that path, we're gonna be Putin's Russia, even without Trump's uh, treason and collusions. So, but that to me is the fundamental of how we need to think about the economy and how we talk about politics. So in talking about politics, we have a brother here who thinks about that a lot. I think about it a lot. I said it's Gerald Lenoir from the Haas Institute. It's good to see you on the screen. Unfortunately, see you. Not in person, but uh, my question is on politics. Whether or not there are organizing groups and and policy advocacy groups that are currently taking hold of this idea and running with it and, and, and advocating and trying to implement it anywhere, municipality, state level, federal level, uh, anybody advocating for, for this program? Um, yeah, well, there, there are two different issues. One is advocacy and one is actual attempts at implementation. Yeah. Uh, so there actually are are several groups that have become advocates. Uh, most notably, uh, 
two of the black activist groups in the United States, Black Lives Matter and uh, Black Youth Project 100. Both of them have developed uh, uh, policy agendas and both of their policy agendas include uh, a job guarantee. Interestingly enough, the Center for American Progress recently has endorsed the federal job guarantee as a, as a policy that they, 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 they are now recommending. Uh, so, so those are, are three groups that I could identify as advocates. Um, there's, also, uh, uh, there's also a researcher who is associated with, uh, uh, which, not, not the Heritage Foundation, the other one that's not quite as uh, right wing in, in DC. American Enterprise? <laughs> uh, yeah, the American Enterprise Institute. Uh, his last name is, is Hassett, H-A-S-S-E-T-T, -S -S -E and I think he recently took a position in the Trump administration, of all things. Uh, but he's actually been an advocate of uh, a job guarantee, and I think the primary reason is because in his own family, he has acknowledged the importance of the Works Progress Administration in enabling his family to survive and weather the Great Depression. And so during the Great Recession, he actually was advocating uh, a, a federal jobs program. So, uh, so that's somebody from kind of the, others, the other end of the spectrum who actually has endorsed something along these lines. So, uh, so there are some advocates. Now, in terms of implementation, uh, in the US context, I'm not aware of any actual attempt to do this. Um, the, Examples that I have of something along these lines being pursued are primarily in Chile and in India. Uh, in Chile, they have a program that's called Jefes de Jefes, where heads of household are guaranteed employment. And in India, there's a program called the Mahatma Gandhi's Gandhi Rural Employment Program, which is essentially an employment guarantee for all uh, all folks living in rural India. It's a guarantee that assures them of 100 days of paid labor. Uh, so it's not quite as, uh, as dramatic as the type of program we have in mind, but it's definitely a, a precedent worth considering. And there are some problems with that program, but it appears to have actually had a positive anti-poverty impact in the sense that it has reduced malnutrition in many rural areas. Okay, thank you very much, Sandy. Appreciate you taking the time and have a good time in Montreal at your conference later thank this you. week. <laughs>